This summer, I began my second decade of living in Seattle. And as I reflected on that, I realized just in that short span of time, I've been able to get involved in civic life in this city to a degree that is pretty much hard to contemplate in just about any other city in this country. I grew up outside of New York City. I lived for many years in Boston. And I came here to Seattle from the other Washington. And the other Washington, as you all know, is a place where at least they say ideas and certainly the pursuit of power are the coin of the realm. But the realm itself is strangely devoid of a sense of place. Well, here in Seattle, we have a sense of place. We have it in spades. And you see the measures and the fruits of that sense of place in every aspect of civic participation. When you compare Seattle to other great cities in the United States, on just about every measure, voting, philanthropy, volunteerism, problem solving with a neighbor, membership in a group and an association, Seattle often ranks in the top 10 and often in the top three cities in the United States. It's a pretty remarkable thing that we have this robust civic life here. But these statistics, these measures, are merely the external deposit of an internal spirit. We've got a spirit here that is entrepreneurial, that is engaged, that is not hierarchical, that is participatory, a spirit that is about belonging, about compassion, about pro-social emotions and ways of living and being. It's a spirit that, yes, is sometimes very earnest, but it's one that is equally recklessly playful and completely disregarding of inherited ways of doing things. There are, to my mind, a lot of sources of this remarkable spirit. I think one of them is the fact that we live in sort of a Goldilocks town. It's not too big, not too small. It's not too hot, not too cold. It's just right. We're a city with an equal mix of newcomers and longtime natives. But it's not just that we revel in the mean and this kind of moderation between extremes. What makes Seattle special also is that we have the amalgamation of those extremes. And so on the one hand, we have this incredible community of people. We are one of the most highly educated cities in the United States. And at the same time, our politics and our culture is deeply populist and anti-elitist. We have a culture here that is all about celebrating what people can do in technology and intangible forms. And yet, so much of our lives in the city, what makes Seattle, Seattle, is about the tangible. We are a city of aficionados, whether it's about coffee or cupcakes. <laughs> and yet, at the same time, in our culture, we are deeply against the idea of social snobbery. And in the city we have, yes, you know, Nassim alluded to it earlier, this Scandinavian Asian reserve, this Seattle coolness. And yet that sits right alongside the white hot intensity of the tech world, uh, to say nothing of Sounders fans right now. <clears throat> All these ingredients form what I think of as the base for our rich civic stew here in Seattle. And it's a remarkable base of ingredients that we're blessed to have. But there are three elements that I think of as not material, but ethical. Three aspects of spirit that really form the special sauce that we have here in civic life in Seattle. And I want to say a word about each of these three elements. The first one is what I call garden brain. Garden brain. We are a city of gardeners. You look around, we've got 73, 74 uh, official pea patches, community gardens all across the city. There are thousands of personal private gardens in our homes and our parking strips that yield a year-round bounty, this incredible harvest. We walk through woods, whether in the city in Madrona or outside the city, just a stone's throw away. We have this deep appreciation for trees, for forests, for the very theme of our gathering today. And what comes with this garden brain? I would say that Living in Seattle, you absorb a mindset, a way of thinking and being in just the same way that plants here absorb the, moist, absorb the moisture that is in the air. And that way of thinking and that way of being is ecosystem thinking. It is recognizing that all of us are interconnected in this web of causation and consequence, that there is no way to kind of separate one's deeds from one's actions, from one's consequences. And this idea of ecosystem thinking is profound. It shapes every dimension of public life here in Seattle. And you can contrast it with machine thinking, with machine brain. In other cities in America, the machine is the dominant metaphor. 
You think about the politics of a city like Chicago, and you think about the Daily Machine that dominated politics for over a century. You think about New York City the century before, and you think about Tammany and Boss Tweed and the machines there. In Seattle politics, the idea of a machine is practically laughable. The idea that there would be some cabal of people running things and distributing things in this industrial mode. It doesn't work that way here. But it's even beyond politics. The way in which the industrial mind shaped the way that all social activity is organized in so many other cities. And so, if you think about machine brain versus garden brain, you can make some very simple comparisons. Machine brain gives you a march on Washington, organized by a central command, with armies of people bust in to fill them all and to be something like props in the visual. I don't care whether that march is organized by Glenn Beck or by a group of progressive organizations like what happened last weekend. That's machine brain, this kind of mass logistical operation. Garden brain? Garden brain is what happened here in Seattle two years ago when the Seeds of Compassion event was held in Seattle. Over five days with His Holiness the Dalai Lama as the magnet, and yet an event that was organized completely organically. That was this self-organizing miracle of people stepping forward from one corner of the community to another, deciding they would want to play together, finding new ways to make things happen and connect. Yes, loosely conducted by a group of people, but with music that was unforeseen and untold in its beauty and power. That's garden brain. Machine brain gives you a mindset that thinks, well, government is there to be something like a vending machine. You put in your coin, you get your benefits. Garden brain tells us that every single one of us is a gardener to weed, to seed, and to feed. The second ethic here that I want to speak about, about Seattle's secret civic sauce, is what I call one plus one equals three. In so many other cities, you have an idea of life as a zero-sum game. What's good for you is bad for me. What's bad for me, what's bad for you is good for me. And this idea that you have these trade-offs shapes so much of economic and civic life in big cities. Think about life in New York. Think about life in L.A. And we have here a different mindset, a way of thinking of things not as zero-sum, but in terms of non-zero math, in which we think about cooperation coalition. Many of you know here Roberto Maestas, who passed away recently, who was one of the great leaders of the civil rights community in Seattle, but was also one of what was known as for, the Four Amigos, Four people from the Latino, the Asian American, the African American, and the Native American communities who a generation ago decided, unlike in other cities, they weren't going to be at odds with one another. They weren't going to be grabbing for turf. They weren't going to be jockeying to see, to see who was going to be able to get more political influence, but that rather they would make a coalition, that they would work together in concert. And that is a, an act and a set of choices that was made a generation ago that has played out year after year in Seattle's civic life, that other cities are hard-pressed to try to replicate. This idea that one plus one can equal three. The third and the final dimension of this secret sauce that I want to talk about is what I call library thinking, for reasons that I want to explain in a moment. But it boils down to this very simple precept, which is that society becomes how you behave. Society becomes how you behave. Think about that for a minute. In most of American life, we are told by the marketplace, by politics, by culture in general, that we are rugged individuals, that our actions as individuals, whether they're good or they're bad, they're canceled out by someone else's actions. So you may as well be most rational and most calculating in the pursuit of your own selfish ends. Well, that idea in Seattle doesn't hold. In Seattle, we do things like support levies for housing, levies for schooling, levies for family supports that don't benefit most of us. And we do so gleefully, almost masochistically, taxing ourselves year after year <laughs> on this idea that we're all part of something greater than ourselves, right? This idea of rugged individualism doesn't obtain here in Seattle. What obtains here instead is a notion that we're all in it together. And one way to think about this is about, as I said earlier, ecosystem thinking. But because I'm the son of a former librarian, and I serve on the Seattle Public Library Board of Trustees, and because this is a city that is gaga for its libraries, I want to use libraries as a metaphor. We live in Seattle not like we're on some wide open frontier and range. We live, in here, we live here in Seattle as if we all share the same space. We live here in Seattle like we're all in one big library together. 
We share our space. We learn together. We cozy up. We respect one another. We live with respect for the place and civility toward one another. Library thinking. These three simple ideas, garden brain, one plus one equals three, library thinking, they are what I think makes Seattle so special in the country and the world. But I want to close on a TEDx kind of note, because these things aren't just Seattle. This spirit is a civic spirit that is portable from city to city, from place to place, and from person to person. And the thing that we get to do here in Seattle is pay attention to these values, to nurture them and sustain them, and to figure out how it is that we can make them contagious, how we can set off epidemics of this kind of pro-social thinking. That's what it means to live in Seattle and to live in the world. This idea that there is no me without a we, today is very Seattle. In 20 years, 50 years, maybe 100 years, it will just be human. It's an idea worth spreading. Pass it on.